Take your Bibles, go to the book of Job, would you? So let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. The story of Job is an amazing, an amazing story. And truly, truly, we uh, need to learn something from him. I think I turned it off, didn't I, brother? You had it on and I turned it off. Is that correct now? It's got to be green. The Lord's good, amen. There was a man in the land of Uz, chapter 1, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Amen. That means he hated evil. Amen. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and he offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Amen. Now there was a day when the son of God, sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath. Here's his prediction. And he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job they said the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. The Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God. Boy, isn't that something? The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants. And consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Yet he had, while he yet was speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young man and they're dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and he rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and what did he do? Worship. He worshipped. 
and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth? Amen. A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, Amen. although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. Here's the second prediction. And he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So when Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his feet and to his crown, and he took his pot shear, to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Amen. Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? Amen. In all this did Job not sin with his lips. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, teach us. Yes. Teach us what we need to know yes. we pray, Lord. as we are in the hedge. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. The title of my message is, Are You in the Hedge? If you go back to chapter 1, verse 10, you'll find that Satan accused the Lord. He's always trying to accuse. He said the only reason Job is the way he is is because you've put a hedge about him. Sounds good to me. You know, when I got saved, I knew it. There are people that have made a profession of faith, but they didn't know it. I went forward at six years old to get saved, but nobody dealt with me, so I thought I went forward, so I must be saved. I turned 14, and my dad let me know very emphatically that uh, he had never seen any indication that I was ever saved. And I had to agree with him. And that was the day I got saved. Anybody can say they're saved. I was talking with a young man one day, and I said, are you saved? He goes, of course. I said, when did you get saved? He goes, well, I was in this car accident, and God spared my life. That's not the saved I'm talking about. I'm talking about the born-again experience. Coming to that place where you know that Jesus saved your soul. It's settled. There's no question about it. I know where I was when it happened. Right. And he saved me. And I've not gotten over it yet. Amen. <laughs> oh, I hate it when I see Christians that have gotten over it. Well, Job never got over it. Amen. And you notice his life here is, is just a premium example of, of staying in the hedge. When I think of a hedge, and I'm just going to illustrate it this way, just pretend that the distance between these, the, the pulpit here would be my hedge, okay? And if I stay in that hedge, I know that I am in the perfect will of God. Right. Right. Satan can't get me. Right. Nobody can discourage me. Right. My life is secure in Christ and everything that comes into my life, God knows about it. 
And if he decides he wants to allow it, praise the Lord. Amen. Well, that's easy for you to say. Well, I'm, give me a chance. I'm going to share with you sometimes I was wondering where God went. And I felt as though I was in the hedge and that everything was okay, but God allowed things to come into my life. Number one, I want you to write this down. God's people must surely be loved and highly favored that God would put them in a hedge. Amen. I believe every born-again child of God is in safety the moment they get saved. They may not understand all about God, but they can be sure of one thing, that they are in God's hedge. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the hedge. In fact, in Revelation 12, 10, the Bible says, Now has come salvation and strength in the, in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ for the accuser of the brethren, that's the devil, has come down which accuseth them before our God day and night. Amen. You're under attack, folks. You'll always be under attack. Because you belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And may we never forget that passage of Scripture where it tells us that the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, But I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have it more abundantly. Now many Christians have never figured out what the abundant life really is. The abundant life is in the head. And you know when you have an abundant life. Amen. It's more than just being saved. Right. I, I don't need just a fire escape from hell. I need a Savior to guide me and direct me into Amen. every intricate detail of my life. Right. I'm foolish to think that I can get by without God even for a moment. Right. Yeah. Many Christians don't think that way. Have you ever heard about stumbling Christians? Have you ever heard about sleeping saints? Have you ever heard about backslidden Baptist church members? They're all those that have stepped out of the hedge. Lord, I know you're really busy. And there are a lot of people that are worse than me, so I'm good. And I can handle this. You work with the hard cases. Because I am very religious. And I do many wonderful things for my Lord. You know that, don't you? But I, I just... I just want to do this one little thing. You know, the Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's those little excursions that you take into sin thinking, well, you know... God understands. Well, according to what our brother preached, Amen. God does not right. understand yeah. our finite thinking. Right. He's infinite. Amen. And yet he cannot accept some of the things that we do. Right. And we call ourselves Christians. And oh, may God help us. You see, we're highly favored by God. You think your parents love you? It doesn't even compare with God's love. Amen. He loves you so much that He gave Himself for you. Praise the Lord. And I believe that God desires all of us to live the abundant life only. Amen. And stay in the hedge right. protected by God. So that anything that comes into our life while we're in this hedge, it's going to be okay. Have you ever met people that were in the hedge and when tragedy came to them, they sounded like the Lord talking? The Lord. Not many. Right. But once in a while, you'll find people that have gone through tragedy, sickness, difficulty, but they never had a bad attitude. Amen. They never even questioned God. Good. And they were like Job, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. There was no flesh involved in it. It was all... Complete trust in God and God alone. When a person comes to that place, they become a leader. 
not just a follower. There are people that, isn't it interesting, there's some people that when you really want to get an answer to prayer, you know, how to, you, know how to, you know who to talk to. And there's some people you wouldn't talk to. Those are the people that are, you can't trust them. Their word's no good. They talk behind your back. They get bitter about things. They're still bitter about 20 years later. They've never given it over to God. They're not in the hedge. They're hanging out, out of the will of God in some cases, merely in the will of God, barely in the will of God, but fighting God instead of surrendering to God. Number one, we're highly favored. God's people are highly favored. Number two, God's people are liable to danger and injury. Believe it or not. Listen to this verse of Scripture, Ecclesiastes 10.8. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whosoever breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Wow. You take away the hedge, the Bible says in Isaiah 5.5, 5, and it shall be eaten up. You take away the hedge, and you will be game for the devil. Oh, what a sad thing it is. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, verse 30, I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap for me for the people, but I found none. I'll tell you what, spirit-filled Christians are becoming rare. And I don't have to tell you a bunch of bad, sad stories to prove to you that our churches are full of people that are not in the hedge. You ever give somebody advice and they didn't take it and then you watch them fall on their face? One of the greatest heartbreaks for a pastor is people that come into his office already deciding what they're going to do. They just want him to go, yeah, go ahead, brother. It'll all work out. And it won't all work out. And it'll be a disaster for your family. It'll be a, a bad testimony for the church. Don't we understand that there are some things... Listen, if we know our Bible, we know what's right and what's wrong. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. I don't have to say, well, you know, Lord, what do you think? I don't even have to ask Him to think about it. All I have to do is say, okay, Lord, I got the message. The Holy Spirit, He, he just he hangs out with me. How many, how many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. wonderful I know I'm privileged but I have God's advice with me all the time and when I don't listen to him I try to listen to my wife <laughs> men are smart when they listen to their wife especially if she walks with God Amen. and knows the Lord and says I, I, I wouldn't do that I remember I said honey I think I'm gonna grow a beard she said think again <laughs> I told my dad I wanted long hair. He said, where are you going to live? <laughs> it never fails. There's always somebody there to try to straighten me out. Amen. Don't you love those that love you so much that they would tell you the truth? Paul told the church of Galatia, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Why do we get mad at people that want to help us? Because we're spoiled. And I'm going to do this whether you like it or not. That, that, goes, that goes for a bad marriage. How many Christian homes have been broken? They say in some cases it seems to be almost worse than the world. And the way they live. And how can Christians justify rebellion against God by doing what they want to do instead of what God wants them to do? Where the, what's their thinking? Why are they doing those things? It's because they, they stepped out of God's protection. And they opened themselves up for the arrows of the wicked one. In Jonathan Edwards' message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, he talks about the bow and the arrow is coming at you. Justice bends the bow. 
And God judges sin. Right. God really judges sin. Amen. And we must take account of ourselves and say, if I'm going to have to go through some danger and some injury and some difficulty, I certainly want to know that God is with me. Right. And that God allowed this into my life. I'll never forget when my mother was killed in an automobile accident. I had the wrong reaction. I made the statement in my mind, why didn't, why didn't God take some bum off the street? Why did he take my mother? Now that's a wicked statement right there, especially if the bum's not saved. But I went up and I looked at her picture and looked into her eyes. And the Holy Spirit said to me, here's, here's the hedge, folks. Amen. The Holy Spirit said to me, would you wish her back to this sin-cursed earth? Good. I'm not kidding. Amen. Just like that, my whole attitude and spirit changed. Praise the Lord. My mother is in heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'll never forget the time I got in trouble. One of the times, my mother... My mother was home and my dad was gone, so she said, get in the bedroom. That meant we were going on a whaling expedition, but <laughs> we, we, we get in there and, and she said, uh, she brought a Bible in with her. Usually she always brought the strap that she had around her neck most of the time. Five boys, you know what I mean? So she comes in there and she puts a Bible in my hand. She goes, turn to Revelation. Amen. Read about the unbelievers and the liars and the murderers. And read about that. Read that, those verses right there. Amen. She went off to do her work. She left me in there quite a while. I mean, how many times do you, do you have to read it? I got the message. And she said, where are you going when you die? Hell? That's what it said. Is that where you want to go? Not really. Amen. She goes, just sit there for a while and think about it. That was my spanking. I never forgot that one. Amen. 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 God puts people in your path to help you stay in the hedge. The and thank God for it when your parents say, no, you can't do that. Right. Say, great. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad you're there to stop me from getting in trouble. I'll never forget it, but on my graduation night from high school, man, I was excited about it. There was this girl in town I really liked, and I was going to have a summer, if you know what I mean. Dad said, Dan, I'm still in my uniform. Dan, go over to the house. Behind the wall there, there's suitcases. Grab a suitcase, fill it up with the stuff you're going to need for the summer. You're going to help a man start a church this summer. Great. No. I went, really? He said, yeah, and you're going to drive the other vehicle, follow them up, up to Albany, that they're going to start a church up there. I said, okay. I was a little disappointed, but that girl I liked, God didn't like her. And I don't even know if she was in the hedge. But he sure liked me, and he got me out of town. Oh, God works in mysterious ways. His wonders Amen. to perform. And then after the summer, helping that church get started, and then I went to BBC East for the first semester, drove up on weekends, helped that preacher for a semester, and then the second semester, God gave me a church. What if my dad had just hadn't been thinking about my spiritual condition and where I... How many of you know God knows you? He knows every thought. He hears every thought. He hears every word. He watches every deed. You know, the Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. I wonder how many of those wicked people are Christians that have gotten away from the Lord. Oh, they still go to church. Hi, Pastor. It's so good to see you. 
And if you knew what they were doing, you'd, you'd be shocked. One time in a, preaching, in, a, in, a, in a meeting I was preaching, a revival in Rhode Island, when I came to the end of the message, I just said, the Lord's just, just made it clear to me, you're not going to have a normal invitation tonight. You just tell everybody to get up and start confessing their faults. And you go over there to the pulpit chair and you pray. And I was like, what's the pastor going to think? That could be opening a huge container of worms, if you know what I mean. I did it. Amen. The pastor's sitting down there. I, didn't see, I couldn't look at him. I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. The message was 40 minutes, and the confession time was about an hour. Amen. I couldn't believe it. Nobody was inappropriate. One man stood up toward the back and he said, if you people knew how wicked I was, you wouldn't even shake my hand. Pray for me. I need victory in my life. One lady stood up and she said, I've been mad at God and I've been mad at you women in the church and I've just been irritable just to make you irritable because I'm irritable. She said, would you ladies forgive me? And the ladies started walking out of their chairs, came over, hugged her neck, said, we love you. We'll be praying for you. And that woman was beaming with joy because she got that burden lifted. Put it where it belongs in the depths of the deepest sea, never to be remembered anymore. Amen. I could tell you story after. It was so powerful. People didn't want to leave church. So I had some preaching videos by Seitler and Lee Robertson and a few others, and we, we, we spent till midnight listening to preaching videos. Amen. These people couldn't get enough of God. The That's what happens when you stay in the hedge. People were throwing their TVs away. Amen. <sighs> Must I say any more? I think we need a Phone throwing away. Amen. I want to tell you a story about a young man. Grew up in church. Great parents. This went public on Facebook, so some of you may have seen it. This fellow went off to Bible college. Couldn't get victory over pornography. He was so distraught and disgusted and felt wicked and terrible that he left college after the first semester and he went home to announce to his parents, I really want to commit suicide because I can't have victory in my life. The mother would stand out by the door. I'm talking about a Christian family. And she said, I would stand there by his bedroom door Praying, oh God, don't let him take his life. They got him some good counsel, godly counsel. God gave him victory. Amen. And uh, he stood up and publicly in a meeting that I was in. At a missions conference, he told that entire church everything. I was like, wow. There was a holy hush over that place. He said, now I have a flip phone. And I'm not going to let my eyes see anything I shouldn't see. Amen. God gave him a pastor's daughter for his wife. They are going around helping people that are in addiction. You'd be shocked how much addiction is right in the church our independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church. No wonder we have no power. No wonder we're not seeing a, a, a revival and a move of God upon us because everybody's stepping out of the hedge. God goes, if they regard iniquity in their heart, I don't hear them. Can you imagine texting God? What's the percentage of the prayers you hear me pray? 
32.5, wow, not bad. Hold it. When you talk to God, like he was saying, we're going to stand before him one of these days. Amen. Face to face. Praise and I don't want to be ashamed, do you? Amen. So danger and injury may come. Number three, God's people are safe. Whatever evil encompasses them because they do not lie open and unguarded. Amen. If God allows something to come into your life, God is there. Amen. When you're in the hedge, God's there. Praise the Lord. And He will see you through every intricate detail. Sometimes we're so weak. Why did that happen to me? Man, I know people even in the church that aren't as good a Christian as I am. Why don't you put some trouble on them? Seems like they always get away from it. I sense a bad spirit. No. God must have thought I could handle it. He gave it to me. We love gifts. Gifts come in the form of trials. My dad had Crohn's disease. God never allowed Crohn's disease to be healed in his body, his whole ministry. He had six feet of his intestines removed. He had to eat four times a day. Amen. That gave us a meal before we went to bed. <laughs> the kids are hungry. Right. Never heard him complain about it one time. He, was, he almost died twice in the hospital. Started five churches, raised five boys. Started four Christian schools. Amen. Never stopped him. He believed it was something that God wanted him to have. Wow. The Lord. Never a complaint. Man, we get an ingrown toenail and we miss church for two, three weeks. Yeah. What's wrong with us? Have we come to that place where we have become desensitized to the Spirit of God and we're looking for an opportunity to get out of serving God instead of finding a way to get in? Amen. Where's the people getting in? Right. You've got to be in the hedge. Amen. You've got to realize when that trial comes. Let me tell you, Job, we read it. Right. Look what he went through. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm impressed right. with Job. Yeah. Then he had three miserable comforters show up. You ever have that happen to you? You know, insult to injury. Well, you know, I wonder what you, I, I wonder what Job was doing wrong. They sat there, what, seven days they sat there and looked at him and finally they started speaking and it wasn't good. In fact, every time Job speaks throughout that book, he's showing them where they're wrong. It's amazing. Job was so in tune with God that he understood, and he called them miserable comforters. <laughs> Call it what it is, man. You are a miserable comforter. <laughs> you know what? The Lord didn't give him twice what he had until he prayed for those birds. And those guys had to make a sacrifice unto God in repentance of how they misunderstood what God was allowing to happen. Listen, sometimes our minds are so small that it just, it's hard sometimes for us to accept failure or a change of plans out of our control. Maybe that's why God allows it. To bring us to where we're done and then He takes over. Amen. And when you get to that place, you'll love it. Right. You will love it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Does God do all things well? Amen. You know, the Bible says the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. When you fear God, deliverance is coming. 
I don't care what you're going through. You know, when I was a pastor, you know, sometimes things in the church that happen, you're like, oh, man. And you almost get in the flesh and get disgusted and mad and you don't cuss anybody out. But anyway, <laughs> you didn't handle it right. Now look at it this way. If I don't handle a problem right, it's not the problem that's the problem. It's the reaction. Right. Think about marriage. Your wife may say something to you that you didn't really appreciate, it, but it was true. Yes, thank you for that word of encouragement. I, I didn't like it. It's like one boy said to me when I was preaching. He, I got done preaching. He goes, Pastor, I didn't like your message, but I needed it. I wish more adults would do that. Right? Do you see how far we can get out of the hedge? Right. Uh -huh. I don't have time to keep going on the hedge issue, but I, I do want to say to you, and I'm going to give you seven things, just one right after the other. We are deceived, number one, if we think the unrighteous will enter the kingdom. Right. We're deceived. Right. We're deceived if we are hearers, but not doers. Of the word. Number three, we are out of the hedge if we think we have no sin. Right. You ever hear those pious people that go, Yes, I got saved and all my sin, past, present, and future is taken care of, and I really don't sin anymore. You just lied. Right. Number four, if we think ourselves to be something when we're nothing. Right. Let's start off this way I am a zero. But my God loves this zero so much that as long as I remember that I'm nothing and that He is everything, I'm going to live the abundant life. Amen. Number five, if we th we're, 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 we're out of the hedge, if we think that we are wise in the wisdom of this world, right. you know what God calls the wisdom of this world? Foolishness. Number six, if we think we are righteous, but our actions are not the same. Then we are deceived. Number seven, we're deceived if we think we can sow, we can sow but not reap. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I want to close by simply saying, We need to get back in the hedge. Amen. We need to quit making excuses for our little petty sins. Right. I was preaching a message in Texas. It was a message that I put together. You're going to love this title. I, I got rid of it. This title I changed. I changed the title. 73 Besetting Sins was the title. <laughs> and there was a man sitting out there and he went, Oh, <laughs> like, this is going to be exhausting. I said, I better change that. What I did was I just quoted out of the Bible 73 besetting sins. Then I, I ran to Psalm 51. Amen. We studied the prayer of David when he had sinned against the Lord. Every sin is against the Lord. Right. And I want to tell you something. If you knew how many people were going to be affected by your sin, you wouldn't sin. My dad got real discouraged in the church in Florida that he, his last church he pastored started that he thought was going to go big guns and he had the hardest time. It took him 20 years to get that thing strong and he was going to quit one time. And I, my dad was never a quitter. And um, he said, you know, I, I'm going to quit. Then he got thinking. I don't know if he was praying at that point. You know how sometimes when we're thinking, we're not praying. Has that ever happened to you? And um, he said, well, I'll have to call Tim and Pete in France that are missionaries and let them know I'm quitting. Then I'll have to call Tom. He's pastoring in Vermont. I'll have to tell him that I'm quitting. And I'll have to call Dan in Peekskill, New York. He, tell him I'm quitting. And Andy, uh, 
you know, he's a faithful deacon in the church. And I'll, I'm going to have to call my sons and tell them I'm quitting. And he said, I'm not quitting. Amen. See, that's when God gets in it. Oh, we have our moments where we're going to quit or we're going to criticize or we're going to stay bitter. But no, all of a sudden, the power of God comes upon us. Amen. And it's because we're in the hedge. The and we know we want to quit. We know we want to do what's wrong. But the Lord, He talks us out of it. And we can't do it. He, he will crush your plans if you'll let Him. God will crush your plans if you let Him. And you know what he's done sometimes? Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you because he's going to see if you're going to do like Job or you're not going to do like Job. Let's see if he's really got it. Got, let's see if he's really in that hedge the devil hates. He'll let you mess up. because of stubbornness or whatever it may be. Let's bow our heads together and ask God to help us.